But thank you so much for um, uh, giving me the opportunity to share my uh, research on the uh, China's high-speed rail diplomacy. Um, well, once upon a time, the world was united, uh, at least from the perspective of the Roman Empire, where you have uh, Europe, uh, you have Asia and Africa sort of united together. But now it's divided. Um, divided in a sense that we have about um, 200 nation states in the world these days, and it has been divided like that up to this date. And in the future, perhaps, it would be highly connected. That's the world, and that's the story I'm trying to tell within five minutes. <laughs> um, my core puzzle in this research is to what extent has China's high-speed rail diplomacy altered the face of global governance? And in order to solve this puzzle, and here's my plan. First of all, to talk about what is China's high-speed rail diplomacy, and then how does it come about? And thirdly, how has China's rail industry has gone overseas, gone abroad? Well, China's high-speed um, technology was developed amazingly in the last decade or so. Uh, China introduced overseas technology from various advanced countries to build its own system, now measuring about 16k kilometers, uh, 16,000 uh, kilometers uh, in the country, which is about half the total of the world, which is huge. Um, well, this is a table, I won't go into it, um, because we don't have time. Uh, just to show you the importance of China's market in the future. If you look at the red over there, uh, to the right-hand column, this is the country. It's going to have, between the year 2014 to 2030, uh, China's market is about 35% uh, of the USA, 20% of Europe, 35% of Russia, so on and so forth. So you can see that by the year 2030, China occupies the largest markets in the world as far as uh, rail security, uh, rail uh, diplomacy is concerned. I won't go into the details. Um, what are the projects uh, that are available now uh, that China has in um, the pipeline? Uh, China has been negotiating with some 20 to 30 countries uh, on building high-speed rail construction in various continents. Uh, first of all, in Asia, there is the Pan-Asian Network. Um, for example, this is the kind of network China has. Uh, it is still in blueprint, although uh, China and Japan has sort of divided the current market into sort of roughly half-half with the red lines, in fact, uh, that of the, um, the Japanese has, is going to build this red line here across uh, Thailand, whereas China is going to build this one and this one here. And the great ones are yet to be built, yet to be up to bidding and also for other countries to come in. So at the present uh, moment that uh, China is a big player in, in Thailand, <coughs> I won't go into uh, um, Nepal because of the recent earthquake. I can talk about that uh, during tea time if you want to. In Africa, uh, we have Nigeria and we have Addis Ababa to Djibouti. And this is in um, um, Nigeria, as you can see at the bottom of the map there, Nigeria in Africa. And this is the network in red lines of China's um, uh, railway uh, network in that country. And this is um, Addis Ababa to Djibouti. I think this is interesting. I just mentioned one point. And this is this, um, this straight here. Uh, just imagine that there are some proposals already made. Try to build a bridge or a tunnel under the sea to connect um, the Arab world, Yemen over there, to the African world uh, in Djibouti. 
So it helps with there is a small island uh, in the middle, so that one can build a bridge from uh, Yemen to the <laughs> island and then from the island to Djibouti, or use a tunnel, whatever. So it helps a little bit. So that's an interesting point, as pointed out by uh, several people, including, in fact, a Chinese academic. In Latin America, this is not new to all of us here, because we know that um, uh, Yi Jiaqiang is already um, in, in, um, in the uh, country. Uh, this is a kind of um, proposed uh, sort of um, crossing the Latin American continent from the um, Brazilian eastern uh, Atlantic coast <coughs> all the way to, um, say, the Pacific coast of Peru. Um, and thereby, we we'll avoid the kind of use of the Panama Canal there, or the uh, sort of uh, Magellan uh, Strait at the bottom tip of South Africa. And that can connect the various countries along the way. This is already a line on the map only. It is nothing concrete as yet there. But it's interesting as, as a project in mind. And I think uh, Li Jiaqian and the uh, Brazilian president has signed contracts worth billions of dollars to try to build that. Uh, other parts of the world, this is familiar to you. One day you can travel from London to New York. Um, and a successful case so far is that in um, Turkey, all the rest are in the blueprint. And this is between the two biggest cities in Turkey, from Ankara to Istanbul, with the help of Chinese engineers and companies and financial institutions to build this uh, red line here. It's already in operation. It started um, the middle of last year. Um, there is plan to build up the other lines there eventually connecting to Central Asia, to China, and this is to sort of East um, Europe and all the way to London, perhaps. Well, the difficulties are here. I think uh, for the past two days we have discussed about those difficulties, so I'll skip that. Um, the global implications, it seems to me, is trying to balance, in fact, in this panel between um, maritime uh, order and also land order, how to balance that. I think uh, Professor Zhou, uh, in your presentation, you did that uh, mar uh, marvelously well. Uh, in terms of the impact on um, international political economy, um, I try to borrow things. Uh, this is the new global normal to me. Um, it's, it's Xi Jinping's um, economic model, um, um, normal economic uh, normal to try to uh, use this phrase to borrow it and to form a kind of new global um, normal. Whereas um, there is a comparison here between the Chinese way of doing things and the traditional way of doing things with China stressing win-win infrastructure, family to all of us, co-financing. China is not doing that alone by IAB or the Silk Road Fund or the BRICS Bank. Uh, but trying to also gather finance from various sources. And it's growth led to be important. Okay, give, give me one more minute. I shall finish. <laughs> um, this is the geopolitical thing that we have mentioned about how the US is going to contain China. And by looking towards land rather than sea, there is a balance between land and uh, continental order there. Um, the interesting thing is about the line here that the U.S. has set up a surveillance line along this way through sophisticated technology and radar to detect any Chinese submarine carrying nuclear weapons to go out. It's a fishnet. So that all the movements of the Chinese submarines will be monitored. How successful is that? I don't know. So Ida Ilu, as a conclusion, as a work in progress, we all know that it takes about 10 years, 20 years, maybe more. But it seems to me the future appears bright. And I will call this uh, new functionalism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, we have talked about how China is trying to use functionalism these days, using economic cooperation, instead of the high politics of um, interstate uh, conflictual relationship. Um, and high-speed uh, diplomacy is perhaps the core of Ida Yilu. And Ida Yilu is the core of Chinese uh, diplomacy 
at least in 2015 and um, in the near future. So that's um, what I have in mind. And perhaps in the future world, the world is called all connected. Uh, perhaps, you know, um, this is some of the um, China dream turning into a global dream. Thank you so much.